I'm Dr Eddie Hogg and I'm a lecturer in the Centre for Philanthropy at the University of Kent and I do research into all aspects of giving, be that giving of time or giving of money. The research I'm going to talk about today is about primary schools and giving to education and again we look here at the giving of time and money. Now this research is topical and timely because this has been a topic in the news quite a lot recently about the way in which budgets for schools are being squeezed and the way that schools are increasingly having to turn to voluntary action in order to fund their core and non-core activities. So what I'm going to look at over the course of this talk is in four parts. Firstly, I'm going to establish the problem. What it is that we're looking to research here, why this has become a problem. And secondly, I'm going to look at what's been proposed as the solution what's been put out there as the way in which schools can cope with declining budgets. The trouble is that this solution has a problem. The playing field is not level. Different types of schools, schools in different areas, schools with different intakes can attract different levels of voluntary action. So if this is the solution, then there is a problem with the solution. I'm just going to finish by saying what next? What could be the possible next steps we take here? What do we need to look at next? Or what could be the next move? So to look at the problem. Well, school budgets are being pressed like never before. And Russell Hobby, who is the head of the National Association of Head Teachers, has said recently that schools are close to breaking point in terms of their budgets. Now, education is such a fundamental thing to this country's present and future. That if this is the case, if that schools are at breaking point, then that presents real challenges for us. Funding has been cut significantly over the last few years. A fall of 6.5% since 2015. Now that's a significant decline in schools that already were squeezing every last bit they could out of their funding. But on top of that, it's a double problem. Because what's happened is not just that school funding has been cut, but that the other services that schools depend on to support their pupils have also been cut. So mental health support in the community for pupils has seen significant declines, and schools have been expected to take up the slack from that. So it's not just that school budgets have been cut, it's that the entire environment in which schools operate has seen its funding squeezed and seen the pressures on schools increase. There is a revised national funding formula soon to be put in place. And this will change the way in which funding to schools is allocated and, the government argue, improve the fairness and the amount that schools are getting. However, in real terms, this is still a cut on where we were just a few years ago. So even though this is an improvement from the current situation, it's not even as good as the situation was a few years back. So what's the solution? Well, as has been seen in the media recently, schools are increasingly turning to voluntary action as a way of meeting this decline in resources. And when I say voluntary action, I mean both the giving of time and the giving of money to schools. Giving of time can be in terms of volunteers coming into the school, either working with pupils or working in other roles within the school. And the giving of money can be anything from regular giving from parents through to things like FATES and other fundraisers in the community, or money being donated by foundations or businesses in the local area. This is being used to fund not only non-core, extra activities, but also core activities of schools. So things that are a part of their curriculum. And our research found that 28% of primary schools in Kent were using voluntary action, time and money to deliver core activities within their schools. This isn't necessarily new. The presence of voluntary action in schools is not necessarily a new thing. We are familiar with the idea of school fates, with all sorts of fundraising activities for the school, with the PTA, the Parent Teacher Association, raising money in a variety of different ways over the course of the academic year. We're also fairly familiar with volunteering in schools, with parents coming in or former parents coming in to read with young children, with members of the community helping out with the gardening, and with other tasks in the school. So it's not new, but the extent to which it's being relied upon is new. The problem with this solution, or this solution as it's been put forward, 
is there isn't a level playing field. Last year in 2016, I conducted with my colleague Alison Boddy at Canterbury Christchurch University research into every primary school in Kent that was state funded. So that includes not only local education authority controlled schools, but also academies, also faith schools, and a range of different school types. Each school publishes its financial data, which includes numbers on how much voluntary donation, so money it receives. Schools aren't required to collect data on how much volunteer time they get. So we did a survey and we asked schools how much volunteer time they'd get, and about a third of schools, primary schools in Kent, replied to that. So we've got a pretty good response rate, and this data is on pretty secure footing in terms of what it can tell us about what's going on in Kent. And two features emerged as key in terms of what schools look like that affect their ability to attract donations. The first is the size of the school. Basically, the smaller a school is, the more likely it is to be able to attract donations of time and money. This first graph is for time, so volunteer time in schools. And at the left-hand side of the graph, you can see the smallest schools, those with none to 99 pupils. And you can see that they're attracting more volunteer time per pupil than any other type of school. And the pattern's pretty clear. The bigger the school gets, the less volunteer time per pupil is being attracted. This same pattern is true of donated money. Here in this graph, we're looking at the average amount of donation per pupil per year, and again, you find the same pattern. The smaller the school, the more donation per pupil per year is coming. So if we're going to have a reliance on voluntary action, if we're going to assume that voluntary action is necessary in schools and that all schools should be doing it to top up not just extra activities but core, then the smaller schools are going to be an advantage here. Larger schools are going to find it harder, they're going to have less resource per pupil. The other factor that emerges as important is the socioeconomic makeup of the school. Here we have each school that responded plotted on the graph in terms of the proportion of pupils in that school on free school meals and the amount of volunteer time per pupil they attract. What we find is a pattern whereby more affluent schools with a lower proportion of pupils on free school meals attract more volunteer time per pupil. So these are children who are already deprived. These are children at schools where a large proportion of their peers are deprived. And they're getting less extra time, they're getting less extra help and support than pupils who are more privileged at schools with fewer peers who are deprived with more affluent intakes as a whole. And the same is true of money. The relationship's not quite so clear here, particularly because there are a lot of schools, the majority, who raise between five and ten thousand pounds a year. What that means is they've got a pretty active PTA. But the schools that go beyond, again you can see, the schools who are raising really large sums of money tend to be those with fewer pupils on free school meals, and those with more pupils on free school meals tend to be raising less. And when you break these down into bands, it's even more significant. So of schools where over 35% of pupils are on free school meals, the average amount they raise a year is £3,500 per school. In the middle band, those schools with a fairly moderate, less than 35%, but more than 10% on free school meals, that goes up to £5,900 per school per year. The schools with the fewest number of pupils on free school meals, the smallest proportion, well, they're raising £11,000 per school per year. That's a really significant difference in terms of what schools are able to raise and therefore what they're able to provide their students with. So what can we do about this? What next? Well, the obvious answer is to fund schools properly, so that schools don't need to use voluntary action to deliver core activities, so that voluntary action can become an add-on, but not something that's providing key educational outcomes. But that's in a very ideal world. Actually, even if we did do that, voluntary action has a role to play. There is a real value added to the things that donations of money and donations of time can provide. And we should celebrate that. But it should be additional. It shouldn't be for what the core needs of the school and its pupils are. And we need to explore ways in which we can level out this playing field, in which we can ensure a more equitable distribution of volunteer endeavour 
and donated money, while at the same time not stifling the voluntary action that's already occurring. It's easier said than done, and we need more research into this, and we need more policy attention being paid to this issue. Thank you very much.